new disease. And actually, um, so yes, Dana and I have connected, and the purpose is actually to uh, do some work together with the natural farming community. So I'm going to give you an update about the disease, the type of work we do um, in my laboratory, kind of where this is heading. Um, I'll try to be brief. Um, I have a lot of pictures, and it's, it's a lot of scientific stuff, but hopefully um, in a friendly way. So, and please stop me. If you have questions along the way, I'd be happy to answer them, or um, we can wait till the end and hopefully have a better discussion. But I am Lisa Keith, uh, Dr. Flynn Hughes, and Dr. J.D. Friday and I all collaborate on this project, uh, Rapid Ohia Death. Okay. Um, so it's not just us. We actually have a huge Here's, team. Yeah, yeah that would help. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> no, you can read it off my... Yeah. Um, and you'll see a lot of Scooby-Doo references, because that's kind of how I see okay. my laboratory. It's very incorporated. Um, but a big shout out, actually, to Lionel Wade and Blaine, who are in my laboratory and who do lots and lots of work. Okay, so I'm sure you're probably maybe already familiar, and sorry, I'm going to walk around a little, I know. Um, Ohia, the dominant tree, 80% um, in the native forest, a primary succession and old growth species. It forms almost pure stands, and, oh, sorry, already a, a mess up, but yeah. it's super important for our watershed, for the wildlife, um, cultural purposes, I mean, the list is extensive. Maybe I should try this side instead of crossing over. Um, so this, uh, the map of uh, the state of Hawaii, um, indicating how much of the native forests and where you can find all the ohia. Um, so the big island, um, the dry, mesic, wet, mixed, wet, mesic areas, can actually see 252,000 hectares, um, a hectare almost two and a half acres. It gives you an idea of really what's at stake here. Okay. So there's been a noticeable increase in Ohia mortality in the Puna district, um, particularly on Hawaii Island over the last five years. And again, I'll just say one more time, I apologize, I see it got a little jumbled, some of mine. Um, but the picture you're looking at with this red dot actually shows um, 2008, and then what has gone on um, in 2012 with the number of trees dying in that area. Okay. So the project kind of got started, uh, forestry, federal forestry, university, um, really looking at a number of different aspects, but then I became involved with the project um, pretty much the first part of last year uh, to help unravel the mystery of rapid Okia death. Okay. So before I get started really deep into the science, um, I'm a plant pathologist, meaning I study plant diseases, and really what we do is we try to figure out what is it, how bad is it, and how can we manage and control it, okay? Um, it's really important to know what is normal if you're looking for something that's not normal. And then a lot of times, um, the organisms, when it comes to pathogens, they can be native problems, um, which sometimes aren't as bad, okay? So if they're kind of co-evolving with their host, they're not as detrimental as maybe something that's exotic or introduced, an invasive species comes in and actually wreaks havoc. And when it comes to plant pathology, um, it's all about the disease triangle. Without the host, the pathogen, and a favorable environment, you won't actually get disease, okay? So three critical components, but you can see there's lots of areas when it comes to the environment. Um, the susceptible host, um, pathogens can be a number of things. So if there's any way to minimize or actually eliminate a portion of the triangle, you can manage or virtually eliminate disease. Okay, so um, we tend to study the disease cycle. And that means looking for signs of the disease and symptoms of the disease. 
So signs are actually the physical manifestation of the organism, okay? So that can be that discoloration in the wood, okay? That's actually rapid okia death. It can be an odor, like this fruity banana smell, okay? Because of the fungus, it grows and produces that particular odor. We go looking for symptoms, which is how the host responds to pathogen attack, okay? Um, in this case, it was rapid browning of leaves, resulting in complete foliar death. The leaves actually remain attached, okay? So it's almost like a really rapid drought occurred, um, brown leaves attached to the trees. Many, many, many times, landowners are looking out their backyard and saying, it looks like the tree was healthy and in two weeks it's dead. And we heard that time and time again. Um, ultimately resulting, unfortunately, in dead trees. Okay. So the first thing we started doing was field sampling, and it's all about finding the right samples. Um, so we would actually fell the entire tree um, with the typical symptoms. Okay, so by now it's those typical symptoms associated. Um, and once we started sampling, you can see that we would run into the vascular discoloration. Okay, so producing cookies, that was a new term for me, right, as a forestry person. So actually sandwich cookies of, of the trunk area or branches. Sometimes the discoloration was just on the edge and it was really narrow. And sometimes it actually went and it looked like this um, starburst pattern, okay. Um, a little easier sometimes to see if you do kind of a, a slash. Um, on the trunk, you can see the lateral discoloration. Okay, so studying disease, basically with samples, we started to do these tree autopsies. And scientists take a lot of data, they take a lot of notes. And so we start documenting where do we see symptoms, where do we see that discoloration, uh, do we notice that through the smell, um, what parts were it associated with, how far did this extend, things like that. Okay, you bring those samples back to the laboratory, now you have to figure out, well, is it a pathogen causing a problem? And there's just traditional methods to be able to isolate and purify the fungus, in this case, um, onto a plate to get a pure culture. Okay, that's kind of the first stage. That's the key stage. And so, uh, once again, that is um, discoloration caused by the organism, okay, in the wood. This is when you take this discolored wood and actually put it into an environment of high humidity or the fungus starts to grow, it starts to produce these structures, actually called parathesia. There are these fruiting bodies. At the end, it starts to produce a lot of spores or what starts to kind of get around. And it um, doesn't matter what you do, ultimately, it's the pure culture on a plate that you're after, okay? So, we can identify fungi a number of ways. You can have it growing on a plate, see what it looks like, the color, the shape under the microscope, you know, the size of the spores, things like that. Um, we also use molecular analysis. So in a tube, um, you can do work where it, you start actually um, identifying its DNA. And then you can put what you find into a database and see what it matches up to. Okay, so the morphological and the molecular should match. And that's when we realized we were working with Ceratocystis fibriata. Okay. Um, so, once you have a pure culture of the organism, how do you prove that's the pathogen causing disease? Okay. So you go through and you conduct pathogenicity tests. You start with um, a healthy host, in this case, an Okia seedling. Um, you'll see the pure culture of the fungus. Okay. We use a flat graft method where um, we're essentially just putting some of the pure culture of the fungus into the wound because this organism does need some kind of entryway into the host. Uh, wrap it up and sit and wait. Okay, so we thought it's going to be fast, right? It's a pretty harsh organism. And in fact, it actually took a while. And looking at it, you couldn't really see anything, okay? 
Now remember, a lot of people were saying, oh, it looks alive and then it looks dead. Yeah, kind of takes time. And a lot of times it does. Inside, something's happening. The disease process is happening. When do you see the symptoms? And then we walked in um, probably about 65 days later, and we noticed the first sign of wilt. Okay, so that end where that arrow is. Um, the screen wilt. And actually, four days after that, that whole branch died. Okay, so it went that brown, rapid. And within a couple weeks, the rest of the shoots wilted. And again, within those three or four days after, it died. Ultimately, then killing the entire seedling. Okay, so now you're seeing exactly what you're seeing in the field with that. Seems rapid. Um, dead leaves attached to the plant. Um, we do that same kind of autopsy. We know where we inoculated the plant. Is the fungus moving? What is it doing? Um, now you take your cross section and we see that typical discoloration, internal discoloration, and we can tell how far the fungus has moved and where we can find it. And what's really challenging with this is it doesn't colonize the whole tree, okay? It really stays somewhat localized to where it enters, okay? Um, the last stage is actually to end up with the pure culture that you put in the plant. And um, we actually use carrots as a baiting tool, okay? This genera of fungi really like it. It inhibits a lot of other things, so it makes it much easier to collect it back. So that's a piece of wood, and you can see um, some of the discoloration then. Um, the fungus is actually growing into the carrot. And you start to see those same parathesia, all those fruiting structures with the spores, get it back on the plate, and now you have completed post postulates. Okay? Um, it's the same fungus. Um, okay. So that was really only the beginning. Um, a lot has gone on since. A lot of research is taking place. Um, survey. We need to figure out, well, where is this organism um, on island, off island? I mean, extensive work has been done with that. And this is really now to show you that really in less than probably, uh, I mean, we really just discovered and named the disease at the end of last year. Um, so now um, these are confirmed areas of rapid Ochia death on island. Um, it does seem to be <coughs> spreading. Um, right now it is just on the big island. And um, yeah, it kind of gives you the sense of right now, it's now found on Kona side, um, Hilo district, Puna district, it's Volcano Village, um, unfortunately. Okay, so a number of other things. Um, a lot of times the spores, well, in this case, they're not just windblown, okay? Other diseases, uh, the wind can just carry the reproductive spores of the fungus. That's not the case here. Usually they're sticky, um, they attach to something, they're fruity smelling, so oftentimes it has some association with an insect. Um, we don't want to keep cutting down huge trees and we want it to make it easier to sample, easier for people to get us samples. So we really started working on these rapid field friendly assays. So not only could we look at wood, we could look at the soil, we could look at insect grass. Um, we're doing testing. Okay, so yes, there are records of Ceratocystis fimbriata on Hawaii Island. It does cause black rot of sweet potato. That is not the same thing, okay? We could have a discussion all day on the genetics of this organism. Researchers have made it somewhat complicated, okay? But that is not the same C. fimbriata causing disease in Okia, okay? Um, we're trying to do a lot of the genetics work, uh, the biology, so the more you know about the organism, which I'm sure, right, you understand that, the more you understand the biology, um, now you can try to manage it. Now you can try to do different strategies to control it. Uh, okay, so just 
because to me they're cool pictures. They fell off. Um, what the organism looks like under the microscope, again, kind of the close-up of what some of these structures are. Um, we do work with different media components. How does that affect growth? Does it grow faster, slower? What temperature is best? What temperature doesn't it really grow? Um, what type of spores are produced? So this organism produces um, three to four spore types. And one is actually very resistant. It's very resistant to drought. It's very resistant to colder temperatures, warmer temperatures. So they just hang out. And when the conditions are right, they can start causing disease again. Okay. You learn more biology. Um, now some of the management techniques far as we know a certain temperature will kill it if you hit it hot enough. Then you can start working with plant material, um, drenches or water baths. It's, you have to find the right balance. Don't kill the plant, but kill the fungus. Um, we type, start to look at chemicals and things. I know this, it's a bad word, chemicals, but things that are used in other systems um, on the mainland, tree diseases, things we have in the laboratory. Um, very important to see, in this case working with fungicides, there are concentrations where it looks like it doesn't cause them to grow, okay? Control on the left, the center, doesn't look like it grew out, but it actually remained alive, okay? So it's critical. We need to kill it, find the right concentration to kill it, not just kind of have it go into hibernation, okay? And there's ways of, we're working with companies to see about drenching, about injecting, yeah, which is really, um, again, why I'm here to learn as much as I can about what you guys do. Um, so I guess some important closing um, information, yeah. How does the pathogen move? Okay, wood, firewood, don't move it, okay? from infected areas to other areas. Uh, that's probably one of the key ways it's going around, okay? Um, we know we found it in soil. Um, we know we found it in insect frass, meaning when beetles bore in and kind of the sawdust is produced, the sticky spores are attached to that. That becomes windblown, okay? Um, so in mud, vehicles, you can see how even people hiking into infected areas and now into non-infected areas, not a good idea. Okay, so right now, key management strategies, uh, don't move Ohia wood, okay, that's, that's critical. Um, there are sanitation methods that we've tested and we know kills the organisms by using things like 10% bleach, um, rubbing alcohol, um, Lysol concentrate, okay, not just any Lysol. We know Simple Green does not work. It's not effective at killing the organism. Um, washing, right, with soap and water. Vehicles, um, if you're in um, the forests. Um, and so with this type of information and really the critical nature we're dealing with, and because it hasn't been found off island, uh, HDOA has implemented a quarantine on Okia plants and plant parts. Um, we are involved in the testing of things that want to be shipped off island. And that's kind of in a nutshell. Um, a lot of stuff going on, but this is what I see my Scooby Doo. So you gotta, you know, um, would have gotten away with it if it weren't for you meddling kids, right? So, um, I appreciate the opportunity to actually kind of give the information. That's a really good place to go, www.rapidohiadeath.org, set up by the university. Um, all the, everything I'm talking about, all the updates as the maps or the distribution is corrected and enhanced, and that's a place to go. But um, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming. Yeah. You know, what you're saying is that to not remove the tree out of the forest is like saying there, you cannot make smoked meat or you cannot make emu anymore. You know, it's kind of like what you're saying. Um, messing with the lifestyle of the local people, the population we have. You know, uh, not only that, you know, the way I look at it, all of this, 
is all over the island already. It's like fire ants. You know, you take fire ants out of the, the dump and stuff like that, they say, well, you can get fire ants in your property. You already have fire ants in your property. It's all around, you know. So it's a matter of management. The thing about it is, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in my head, you know, you look at, you see this spore, and, and it's, it, I don't know if it's a virus, it's a parasite, you know, what is it? But you look at the things regarding uh, the Tectocardus ovatus, you know, that was introduced, you know, for biocontrol, for uh, uh, the YV issue, the strawberry wall. You know, that's another thing, you know. A lot of stuff is being introduced and stuff like that, and it's messing up with our lifestyle here as local people. You know, now you're saying that, oh, don't take, uh, take it out of forest. Most people are not going to know what's infected and what's not. And they got to make the emu, they got to make their smoke meat. So how are you going to control that? Okay, you bring up a lot of excellent points, and especially the last thing, a lot of bad things are coming in. That's true. Um, knowing areas of infected wood, uh, infected forest, and you can see it if you've been down Leilani Estate. I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible what's going on. Those are heavily infected trees. So if that wood goes somewhere else, and either beetles start boring or you're cutting, you are contributing to spreading the fungus. So um, yeah, it's, it's a real, um, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, we understand the importance of Ohia and what it means, like I say, culturally with the watershed, with the native flora and fauna, um, we're seeing areas, I guess, it's, it comprises so much of the native forest, and right now it's too early to tell if any trees will actually survive, okay? Um, I can't imagine what's going to happen if all the Ohio goes away. I mean, that, that's, we're early into this new disease. So hopefully you can help manage, um, help prevent the spread particularly to areas that we're not seeing those symptoms yet. I mean, that, that's really what the message is. I, I understand a lot of this, the importance, and the, but when it's better not to take wood from Pune District and go to areas close to pristine forest reserves that right now are not showing any symptoms. That's really the best suggestion we can, we can give. Knowing that major tree diseases around the world, that's kind of the number one culprit. That you take firewood, you know, you're cutting down, it's a lot of inoculum, your tools are dirty, you go into a clean area, you haven't cleaned your tools, you now start cutting air. This just perpetuates the disease. So. And you check for the disease over in uh like um, Orchid Land, uh, HPP, yes. all those places, are, are, are they also yes. affected? Yes, they unfortunately, are. the Pune District is um, very heavily infested. Um, I mean, you can kind of keep going towards the park, um, Fern Acres, um, Mauna Loa Estates, uh, Volcano Village. It's not in the park yet. Um, we found it over in Halua Loa, Kalakakua. Um, Really, every day we get new samples, and unfortunately, we're seeing more and more. And again, it's too early to tell um, how bad it can get. You know, I'm not trying to sharpshoot you or anything like that, but then, excuse me. But, um, you know, and this is where you guys come in as far as higher echelon governmental agencies, you know, to, to educate the real estate people and the buyers that's coming in from different countries and just leveling mm -hmm. Ohio forests and stuff like that and put it on for sale signs. You guys should use some of that money to do that. You know, educate the real estate people and then try to, uh, you know, preserve as much of the Ohio and the natural landscaping as possible, you see. And maybe we won't have some of that problem. Now, when you take out an acre worth of Ohio and you just bury it and stuff like that, what the hell does that do? It doesn't do anything but what show waste, you know? So, once you use some of your money to do that, okay, and educate the real estate people, 
and educate the people who come here that don't cut down all the Ohia forests. Protect the forest, protect the Ohia. Do that. Because in essence, what, what, what's happening now is that it's causing a lot of the local population from enjoying the forest. Because you cannot do this anymore. Oh, you cannot, you cannot cook anymore because it's infected. Because you're taking it out of a, a, a place that might be infected. And it's only probability, you know, from what I It's all speculation to me. But, you know, we still uh, get wood for the different parts of the forest. And I've never seen that infection, you know, uh, what you said, as far as that boar and, and things like that. I've, I've never seen really a rotten, um, uh, what do you call it, ohia tree. Uh, did you bring a sample or anything? No, um, I can go back to these real typical symptoms. So again, it's different from a rot. Um, you don't tend to see anything on the outer trunk. Uh, this is looking at an area where you have a, what you're finding. Sometimes they look healthy. Sometimes the canopy looks like it's starting to change a little bit yellow to brown. Um, and then you'll see brown and dead. Sometimes this is looking up. Part of the canopy still looks healthy, dead. Really what's happening is the organism, though it's a fungus, it's getting in, it's plugging the vascular system. Yeah. And um, if you have firewood, you should burn it. It's good. It gets rid of stuff. Um, it's really just a recommendation of helping prevent the spread into other areas. Yeah. So it's not just a process of dying back. No, so it's very different than what occurred in the 80s and 90s. The Ohia dieback was actually um, more of a cohort senescence. Um, lava, first thing that comes, right? It, they, the Ohia, they tend to be all the same age, and it was found that they actually all got old and started dying at the same time. Um, this is really different. Um, again, we believe it's been introduced on a different host. It came in. Um, it finds the environment, it finds another host. Right now, it's not causing disease. We can't find it. We're trying to do studies to see if it can infect other things. It seems really specific for Ohia. Um, and really, um, I totally agree with you. We're trying to get the word out. Um, outreach, education, that's a key component. We have a working group that has like 65 people involved. Um, from the cultural side to the government side to people groups to Facebook to um, farmers, um, really anyone and everyone that will listen. And two, um, to me, environmentally friendly. And um, that, that's key and that's kind of why I was you know, honored to be able to come and kind of share, give a research update, but then how can we attack this problem in many different ways? Okay, we started with fungicides because that's what we had, and that's what we knew helped trees all other parts of the world. But I'm here. Um, I don't really know anything about the natural farming, and so that's why I'm here, to learn, um, to get a better understanding, and actually to do some scientific studies to see can we help this um, in a different way. So I want to learn as much as I can tonight. Um, and answer questions because I know there's a lot of things that you know float around and maybe aren't true with this as well. So. Uh, there are Ohia in New Zealand as well. Has it yes. happened there? No. So as of yet, only this is the only, only on the, the first island. time. Yes. Yes. So you've identified the pathogen, yes. but not the vector. That's correct. We're that's where all the genetic studies we're trying to do. Yeah. Has, has this particular pathogen, is it something new or is it associated with other types of botany disasters? Well, Ceratocystis fimbriata actually causes disease on uh, close to 100 different types of crops around the world, mainly agricultural crops and a lot of times plantation forestry in other parts of the world. Um, this is rather new. Um, actually being involved with the native forest. Um, so good, there's a lot of information to pull from, but you still have to learn what's going on here, and it doesn't follow the typical things all the time. 
when you start looking at the genetic makeup of the fungus, if it's all identical, so it's like, you know, identical clones of each other, oh, I find it here, I find it here, I find it here, I compare, and they're identical, um, usually that's been introduced. Um, it's usually the native things that go through a lot of changes and evolve, and there's a lot of um, differences in their makeup, yeah. Um, so that's why we really believe it has been introduced. And again, right now, this is kind of the first part of the world that is experiencing something like this. But we're connecting with New Zealand, we're connecting um, with other metrosideros, um, trying to figure out, yeah, where did it come from? What else can, you know, be affected? And how can we stop this problem? Yeah. So then is this fungus genetically identical to the other funguses, like the, the one that affects the potato? How no. So yeah, so researchers have uh, complicated things sometimes. Mm -hmm. There's lots of things called Ceratocystis fimbriata. And um, what ended up happening is they became very host-specific. So they found something on uh, Ceratocystis fimbriata but they realized it only affected plane trees, um, like sycamore. And so they changed the species name. And the same thing happened with oak. They found Ceratocystis fimbriata on oak, and they realized, wow, it's only affecting oak. And so that, as their studies have advanced and really looking at the genetics, so that's why we know it's not from sweet potato. It's not from, I mean, there are a couple records in Hawaii on syndonium, and actually on taro, it was found um, on Oahu, on taro. Um, they're not genetically the same, and you can do experiments. It's like um, you can try to infect syngonium, it doesn't cause a problem, yeah, and vice versa. So again, it seems really post-specific. Um, I have a idea it probably will be a new species, um, but that's all the extensive work to come, yeah. Hi. Is anybody doing a seed banking project in conjunction with this? Yes, so um, that will be starting, I believe, around um, February time. Um, but that's some of the stuff we're looking at as well. So on a larger scale, more forestry ecology and plot dynamics and what's happening over time, uh, forestry is really looking at and monitoring, you know, how many trees in a given area become diseased and over time how many are, are actually dying. Um, we're trying to collect seed, uh, actually do studies on host resistance. I mean I know there's very few true species, okay, there's a lot of varieties of Ohia here, um, but that's some of what we're hopeful for. Maybe not all the trees are dying because there are some differences in their genetics that allow them to survive. And then if that's the case, then you can help reforest with things like that, yeah. So if you feel that it's been introduced, is there a core where it's come from, where it's spreading out from? Where is the base? We suspect the Pune district just because of the devastation there already. Um, but again, is that because the environment is just better and it's happening faster? You know, that's that's what we're trying to get a better handle on. In the Coon District, can you narrow it down? Um, it seems like Leilani Estates area. Um, one critical thing that occurred was Kamehameha School lands. Um, they put in a really large fence area to um, protect a pristine area of forest mm -hmm. and um, it's quite devastated now. So um, there is, there seems to be, we get calls far more frequently in that area and we know we found it in the soil there as well, in, like in infected areas, yeah. Yeah. Hi. If you, if you have a long land, a dead tree or two, amongst the growth, um, what, what do you do? Do you cut them down and burn them? Or what do you do? Yeah, that's actually the best thing you could do. Yeah, and if you're going to keep them, you could keep them covered with a the tarp. Uh, so, you know, 
dead and dying trees, that attract insects, the beetles, and so you can prevent them from kind of boring in and creating that that brass. And then the sooner you can actually burn them for firewood, the better. Yeah. Have you uh, found any trees that are still alive in state of trees? Yes. And have you tested them for susceptibility? Um, okay. I think some of it's a timing issue that there has been cases where <coughs> we sampled a healthy looking tree and we could actually internally find the fungus. So the process probably takes a couple years to actually cut off the water supply of a mature tree. Yeah. Um, again, it's more of the forestry plots and actually monitoring over time to see if um, things are going to survive. But just in the last year or two, um, boy, more than a quarter of the trees seem to die. So right now it doesn't look well for those monitoring plots. Yeah. But again, it's, it's like early in, in this whole process. So still a lot to learn. <coughs> uh, we live in a Wikia forest and then seeing it for the last few years. But the only other tree I've noticed is giving some of the symptoms is avocados. I've had some rapid avocado death mm. in the tree. And it's a lot fewer percentage wise, okay. I'd say, than the Wikia. But it was just as shocking to watch it full grown producing novel tree just died from the top down and died yeah. out of nowhere. And I'm wondering if <coughs> cross uh, infection in avocados or is it a different fungus that infects avocados? In so that's not known to infect avocado here. <coughs> Elsewhere in the world it does cause a problem. But I'd be interested in connecting with you if you so still it have. It depend on the variety of the <coughs> Um, it could. As far as right, right. But if it is that similar rapid, I mean, this organism causes very similar symptoms in the lots of trees. And these are like, you know, olive trees. Uh -huh. and first with it, yeah. Okay. Right now. Yeah, I'd like to connect with you. Okay. okay. Is there any plan? Oh, sorry. Is there any plan to do an aerial broadcast? Um, you mean to look at detection or to, to, kill, to kill the fungi? Yeah, that's, that's really the challenge um, on such a large scale native forest. Again, um, in other cases, say with plantation forestry, they knew it was infective pruning tools. So they would see, you know, from one and you just go down the road. Um, and they have a better understanding of when the organism is actually producing the most spores. Um, or other structures that if you, so it was easier to actually manage. Um, so a lot of the diseases, they change management techniques or, um, you know, plant more resistant varieties or this is a new challenge being the forest. Um, so an overall treatment seems very difficult. I mean, unless natural farming. I mean, to me, that, that makes more sense than maybe, I mean, a fungicide treatment in a native forest. No, it will be more of a case by case basis or a potential for stopping the advancing front. Um, so, have you found a fungicide that will actually kill it? Yes, we do have something we're working with. Um, unfortunately, you know, when it comes to the regulations, you have to follow label. And so um, it's not for label use, and currently it's not the way you can actually use it. So we're trying to work with the company to actually see what the potential is. But there is something that will actually kill it. Yeah. Has there been research done on the interaction between other soil organisms around the Ohio trees and the fungus? Not yet. Did I see correctly on the last slide where it said in February 2016 the soil would be 0.9? Yeah, 
Yes, so um, that is still, we're still working to figure out, you know, what is the risk and um, with soil. Now, artificial potting medium or from certified nurseries, uh, uh, you know, other things like cinder, but it's soil from the ground we're trying to figure out, but HDOA, that's part of the list for February. So that's kind of a heads up. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I saw um, an article with your name and a few other people, and I reached out to Lisa because I know that natural farmers have found solutions for many things that are plaguing the earth. And so I put a call out for us to like I, I've been looking at this, the plant slowly smothers it, doesn't, the water won't distribute through the tree. And so I brought lactic acid bacteria because we know as natural farmers that this helps the, the fertilizers move through the plants. And so some of us have brought some of our natural farming solutions for Lisa and her team to experiment with the, on this fungus. I also brought some um, IMO tooth that um, we made, and there is also a, a natural farming brother, Chris Dene in Michigan, who um, is using, Liz brought some of these with us uh, for us to see, but um, he uses this mushroom, it's like a woody mushroom, and he has found success in um, making a solution with this that actually kills this, and so one of the things that I'd love for us to discuss here is, you know, this is just some of the natural farming things that have touched my heart because I'm from here. And I've been watching all these trees that I've known all my life die. And so um, we are going to be working together to find something that hopefully is more natural than a fungicide. Like Kim Chang um, has already said that she's healed a mountain apple tree almost to die, that almost died. So has Chris. Um, Trump in um, Kohala. He has a macadamia nut farm there. And one of the things with the macadamia nut trees is if they get hurt or damaged, the whole tree dies. He has success in saving his trees that have gotten damaged from the machinery when they harvest. And so we know already that we have solutions that help the plants. And so tonight, I would love anyone that feels touched in their heart to be a part of this experiment team to come to me and give me your contact information. This is really important because our Ohia is 50% of our watershed. We want to talk about the California droughts. Well, if this takes effect here, it's going to affect this whole island. It's going to affect us as natural farmers. And so, um, I'm also, you know, when I think about the Ohia, you know, we know how long it takes for an Ohia to grow, okay? I'm glad that there's a seed bank happening. Quite a few of us have been gathering our animals from our healthy forests and preserving them because we know that once those forests die, those types of diversity and microorganisms also go. And so, um, um, yeah, and so if anybody feels moved to help, um, this affects all of us on that, it's such a deep level. And so please come to me. And we'd like to figure out ways um, to work with you and your team to figure out some natural farming solutions. I'd like to encourage some of your people that are with you to take the course next month, get a scholarship from your people, and learn a little bit more. Because as we know, this alone, lactic acid bacteria, this is a miracle, okay? We already know this. This brings no flies, no smells to our pig pens. This keeps, this kills salmonella. This kills all the bad bacteria. Okay, I use this on my counter instead of bleach. Okay, and so I believe we have the solution that it takes time and effort and it takes people with heart that, you know, I know we're all busy just trying to survive, but um, I just wanted to reach out to any of you that want to be a part of this team to work with Lisa to find a way to heal our trees so that we can keep gathering them, so we can protect them, you know, so that we can protect not only our forest but our culture.
And so that's all I'm going to say. I know we went over our time. <laughs> with us. Um, so I took a few notes and I just kind of wanted to build upon what Dana said because I know you're here to kind of learn and to hear from us and to kind of hear. So, you know, I've been doing natural farming for um, about um, eight years now or so. Um, and we've done a lot of research and we started out with kind of just rudimentary methods of figuring out like what works and what how we make things better. Um, one of the things I really learned early on in natural farming is that the plating method, where you're culturing the bacteria on that plate, uh, may or may not be effective for telling you that that's the pathogen that's there. In this case, it looks like that is the one, but um, as um, Michaela mentioned over here, that one of the things we're finding out is that um, in natural farming, it's, there's a new study coming out called metagenomics which is really studying all of the microbes in the soil and how they, when this condition happens, this one thrives and that one takes off and how they're symbiotically all working with each other in there. And so that maybe this, uh, I don't I didn't catch the scientific name of the actual bacteria that's, that's doing the final knockout punch to it, but it may be that the other microbes in the metagenomic um, you know, area are having a fault that then this pathogenic one then has an opportune time on your disease triangle that it now has, you know, the host. Like it's feeding off something else that now it can take over. Um, so plating methods to actually tell which, which bacteria, like primarily we find just the parasitic and bad anaerobic growing ones growing plating methods. And the good microbes to culture them what we do is we look at live soil samples under the microscope to see what's happening in the soils and see all how the other funguses are interacting with each other. And that's the main way we're, we're telling our soil health. And so um, Dana mentioned Chris Trump. Uh, he's a macnut farmer up in Kohala. And he has 700 acres of macnuts. And they've had several different fungal diseases hit them. They've had like rapid die off, they've had slow die off, they've had these different, they've, he has identified at least three different types of fungal diseases that he's completely eliminated from his fields. And the way he's doing that is he's making a fungally dominated IMO solution. And so what it is, is it combines seawater, which has tons of minerals, and the more research I do on that, I find there's a there's a microbe behind every mineral. So when you grab all these different minerals, you get this really microbial diversity you can bring back to the land. He's including in there humic and fulvic acids, which are essentially like wood juices, wood concentrates. And so these really stimulate, fungus loves to look, um, eat wood. You know, that's why it's attacking a tree here. And so when you include the um, humic and fulvic acids, which he gets primarily from um, worm juice, that that then stimulates this beneficial fungus to thrive in this solution he's creating. And then he's making really careful sure to make sure he grabs really good IMO collection from a very fungally dominated area already. So going to where he knows there's already a healthy forest and grabbing that IMO. And the, the fourth thing he's including in this batch is fermented plant juices, which essentially are plant concentrates. It's a, it's a recipe we're all familiar with here, um, but that is just making it into the mainstream in terms of its medicinal benefits and also its plant. Um, it, it contains plant secondary metabolites and all these very essential um, hormones and um, enzymes that other methods of extraction with heat or pressure or other ways kill. But in our method with just extracting with pure sugar and allowing the microorganisms to ferment at low temperature, um, extracts them and they're very pure and in same form. So it's essentially like taking the essence out of this plant without destroying it and putting it into this liquid. And if you look at what happens in a natural healthy forest, the leaves are falling, right? And that's what's feeding the forest and that's what's keeping it healthy. And so this recipe of including the fermented plant juice, which essentially is concentrated leaves, then including humic and fulvic acids, which is concentrated tree branches that fall, then including the, the 
very good beneficial microorganisms that you gather from a healthy part of the forest, and then combining it with seawater, which just enhances that diversity. And like I was saying, in natural farming, it's all about the metagenomics. The more diversity, just like look at this room, the more diversity we get, the more ideas we have coming, the more solutions we get coming forth. And so the seawater to really stimulate that extra diversity. With those tools, he basically makes a compost tea. And he, what he does is he takes his brewer, like a 500-gallon brewer, he brews this tea. He puts in, um, you know, not even that much into the, you know, he has it all measured out, the correct dilutions. He has the recipe. It's actually posted on the Facebook discussion that Dana and I were having. He puts all these things into the tea, and he brews it for 36 hours. And he found that's pretty much the sweet spot because he's doing mic uh, microscope analysis. And he's looking for beneficial fungus, which are the big, nice, dark brown fungus, that those are the beneficial ones. And at 36 hours, it's very highly fungal dominated. And then what he does is he loads it into a sprayer that one of his workers goes and then just sprays all his fields. So he, he stresses the highest precision quality with this. That that's why he brews the tea and loads it into the sprayer for then his workers to go out. Because before he's asked his workers to make the tea, and it's that level of precision that they sometimes, you know, like, oh, you didn't put this much, or you brewed it for maybe 72 hours, or, or you know, whatever happened, that then you are spraying more pathogens out. But when you do this right and correctly, he's able to completely bring trees back to life from the core out. He said sometimes trees will regrow like with certain techniques, they'll put a little bit more foliage on the outside, but he's actually seeing new shoots emerge from the inside out on these, so, so what some call dead trees. Like the tree looks dead, not like it, you know, someone would come and just cut it down because the thing was dead. He sprays this solution and the tree still comes back to life. And so it's an association that as we study more science, we find that there's fungus not only in our soil, but also in the plants themselves, in, in everything. And it turns out to be the most vital part of our ecosystem is this beneficial fungus, which we call it here IMO, which is just, it's just a diversity. It just means it's from here and it's the microbes that are the beneficial ones in our forest. Um, and the other thing um, that I heard previously, I don't know if this was the case, but that it was spreading more on the roadsides. And that may be from vehicles, but also the roadsides um, are constantly, as your exhaust comes out, all these toxins are coming out and just landing. You know, like try to breathe car exhaust for a couple minutes, you could probably die, right? And so this same stuff is being blown out onto the road. So all that beneficial fungus that was in the environment now has a layer of hydrocarbons and toxins on top of it. So as we continue to pollute our environment by driving cars, we're, we're putting more of this toxin out. So the beneficial fungus that was there, it's very essential that it's aerobic. And if it's covered with this layer of oil on top, it cannot breathe anymore. So it starts to die, and then probably this one is anaerobic, I bet. Grows it up, or maybe not. Okay, so so maybe that's through extrapolation on that, but but maybe the metagenomics is changing in the soil so that it's, you know, it's stressed. Like if you have a beneficial thing with plenty of food, plenty of food, plenty of people come, no food, no people come. Same with the fungus in the soil. And so putting the foods out there. Um, and the other, the other comment I just wanted to make as natural farmers, we always make the analogy of like using a fungicide or like an herbicide is kind of like taking your skin and ripping it off. Yeah, sure, I got, now I got clean, sterile environment, but as soon as something lands on me, I now immediately got infection. So if I use a fungicide, yeah, I can get rid of it, but I've now stripped all those beneficial guys as well. It's like you got a criminal in Hilo and you use a nuclear bomb to get them. Yeah, you got them, but you caused a lot of collateral damage as well. And so fungicide, we tend to go away from that. And instead of just using one bomb to blow it up, we just bring in beneficial people to like hold space, to do good things. And so we take a probiotic approach. And that's what all about the IMOs is about is just bringing so much diversity, so many good things into the soil that there's no room for bad guys. You know, if there's a bad guy in here, we throw him out, right? <laughs> but if we set off a bomb in the bad guy game, who's gonna throw him out? 
So we like to use just simple analogies along those lines to just start our thinking towards just putting good guys out there and really trying to see how can we get the good guys? What do they need? What do the good guys need from us to naturally combat things like this? Because in a healthy forest, you don't see stuff like this happening. But as we toxify our world more and more, you start to see all kinds of plagues like this just popping up. And so our whole approach in natural farming is just restore, regenerate, rejuvenate, get foods out there, get good guys out there, and let them take care of it for us. So that's my mana on that.